She's the director at the Center for Media and Social Impact at American University, which provides some spectacular uh, reports about media impact and you know all kinds of things. And she's gonna she'll probably tell you more about that. Uh, I want to let you know, especially for our OV audiences who have been reading about our panels and forums online that we do have a change in this program. We are honored to have Jeffrey K. Lee, who's general manager of WHUT, joining us today and to thank WHUT for being a media sponsor for H AFI Docs as well. A couple of housekeeping items. Uh, for those of you using the Wi-Fi inside this building, can you please not do that? Only because we need all the juice we can get to stream these sessions on YouTube. So if you can refrain from using the Wi-Fi, we greatly appreciate it. Um, also, for our OV guests, please retweet the URL to your friends or post it on Facebook so that they can join this conversation. And now I will hand over the mic to Katie. Oh, I was talking. <laughs> okay, hi, thank you so much, Michonne. Um, so yes, my name is Katie Borum Chateau, and I'll just start by um, giving a brief little introduction about the center. So I run the Center for Media and Social Impact, as Michonne mentioned. It is an innovation lab and research organization housed at American University in the School of Communication. And essentially, I won't go through our whole boilerplate, but what we really pride ourselves in doing is listening to the real questions and areas of exploration that happen in the field that intersects democracy, independent storytelling, entertainment storytelling, the effects on the audience. Um, and so lately, within documentary studies in particular, we have produced, uh, we think, is um, the only two studies that exist around diversity in documentary storytelling. We're really proud of that. We think that's something that deserves real accountability and continued tracking. We also uh, recently, actually to the point of this panel, we recently released the first of a two-part uh, research series on documentary films and public policy in the United States. The first report that's out already, uh, you cannot use the Wi-Fi to find it right now though, <laughs> is uh, documentary films and public policy related to federal level policy making. And the second one coming, uh, coming out later this year when we finish writing it is on state and local level um, engagement. And I, I want to say here that we uh, pride, our, pride ourselves on our work being um, uh, not ideologically slanted. This is sound academic research. We also publish in the academic space. And we think that's really important because I, I think that it's very easy for us to fall into these tropes in this moment to talk about right and left and ideological persuasion. And really, I think that you'll hear from the panel today that when we talk about local community engagement and localism and the role that public broadcasting plays, that is a really vital public service that should not fall into one side or the other. So it's just my, my small little soapbox moment. Um, so I always feel like the job of a moderator is to get out of the way. So I'm going to briefly introduce my esteemed panelists, and then I'm going to throw them some questions. And uh, we'll start in a lively dialogue and hopefully save a lot of room for questions for you all. So first of all, oh, I have you all out of order. Uh, now, you have everyone's bios. So I'm not going to read everyone's entire bios, OK? You'll all be happy about that. Uh, Naomi Starobin, Starobin, did I say that correctly? Starobin, I identify. Nobody says Chateau correctly. Uh, is a radio general manager at WHYY and founding editor of Keystone Crossroads, which is a collaborative statewide journalism project. And we just discovered that we worked with the same person at the Philadelphia Inquirer. It's very exciting. And right to her left is Emily Hackshaw, who's the director of community engagement at Georgia Public Broadcasting. And she oversees strategy and execution for community engagement efforts and initiatives on the, obviously, really on the local level. And our superhero star, who just joined yesterday, we're so glad he's local, is Jeffrey K. Lee, who's the general manager of WHUT, which is on the campus of Howard University, so uh, right here in town. Oh, we should pause for that. <laughs> yes, uh, he has quite an amazing bio, which I am not going to. But I just want to remind everyone again that really the point of this panel is to talk about the role that public broadcasting, both radio and, um, and television, really plays on the local level in communities around the country. And for many communities, public broadcasting is actually the only way in 
So I think it's important for us to remember that. And those of us who live in cities, I think it's convenient for us to not think about that. But that's really the point of this conversation. So I'm going to start with you all and actually just ask you all to give a, a very brief, you know, one or two sentences that describes how you approach your work or uh, how you work in terms of uh, localism and community engagement vis-a-vis -vis this context. Hello, test, hi. So can they be one or two really long sentences? <laughs> With, With Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, I just want to explain that I'm wearing two hats today. I work at WHYY as the radio general manager. It's a pretty new job. I was, as you said, the founding editor of a project called Keystone Crossroads, which is a statewide state, meaning the Keystone State, Pennsylvania, reporting collaborative among four public radio stations. And about three years ago, the project was born with CPB funding to the tune of about $2 million to report on the distressed cities in Pennsylvania with the idea that, uh, that uh, Pennsylvania being a kind of parochial place, uh, could people could come together and discuss and understand and learn more about the roots of the distress in the cities, having to do with the disappearance of coal and steel, um, but also come together and look at solutions that have worked in different places and how could they work in my place. So that's what our journalism project has been about. We're entering our fourth year now. But I, I also will be giving examples of WHYY's mission and some things we're doing to, uh, to sort of engage civically. Um, so just really quickly, those two. Uh, Keystone Crossroads, this project, uh, from the start was a, the, a very basic mission of it was to engage in civic engagement, sorry, bad sentence, um, but to go out into communities, hold events, talk to people. I mean, reporting is always about getting out onto the street and talking to people, but to actually bring people together to discuss uh, what's bothering them in their communities, in this case, and what, uh, what could be done about it. Uh, so we had, you know, probably about a dozen events in three years at least where we did that. WHYY, the radio station and television station, also has events where we invite people in to talk about as recently as a discussion about race and what divides us and what brings us together, um, debates, political debates, all those kinds of things. So really sort of at the core of what we do, both Keystone Crossroads and WHYY, but also, and I hope to talk about this a little bit, um, some of the challenges we see and some of the places where I think we've sort of fallen flat on the mission. I feel like you need to, can you just expand on that just for a second before we go to Emily? The falling flat part? Well, yes, that was a cliffhanger. <laughs> what does that mean? Uh, it's kind uh, Oh, do um, you want to wait? Yeah, I want to wait. It's too long. Okay, I feel so like we should. Be on the edge of the <laughs> okay. Um, well, Georgia Public Broadcasting is a dual licensee. So we are a statewide organization um, with nine television stations and 18 radio stations across the state of Georgia. And um, we interact uh, with about 2.6 million people each week. Um, about 1.7 million of those are in Metro Atlanta. So localism for GPB is kind of interesting because um, Georgia is is an interesting place because we have Metro Atlanta, which is um, you know a major metropolitan area that is full of transplants from all over the country, all over the world. Um, we have coastal cities, we have barrier islands, we have rural farmlands. So we at GPB are engaging with all of those communities, um, which is very interesting, presents challenges, presents opportunities. Um, but our mission at GPB is really to inform, educate, and um, entertain. And so our community engagement efforts are really um, planned in a way to do that, um, using both local content, national content, um, to, to reach all of those kind of communities that I just described. All right, Jeffrey. OK, good. Um, as stated earlier, I'm Jeffrey Lee. I'm the general manager at WHUT here in Washington. And we're one of three stations that serve the nation's capital here in terms of our broadcast signal, along with WIDA to the south of us and Maryland Public Television to the north. They both serve this area. But we are a little different than the other two stations in that we, are, we consider ourselves a um, really community station. We're on the ground in the community. We have made uh, commitments to serve on the ground, utilizing the content that's created by PBS and 
Corporation for Public Broadcasting. We take a lot of the content off of the screen and put it on the ground in the communities, specifically here in the district in Ward 7 and in Ward 8, where there's a, a, a larger need for the kind of content that's provided there. So we do a lot of our uh, outreach in the children's space, but we do use documentaries fairly re frequently in terms of local documentaries that we run on the air here and then bring uh, the community into our studios as well as go into different theaters around the city, <coughs> excuse me, to have viewings of these documentaries mm -hmm. and then have discussions about the topics that are discussed in the documentaries. So our mission is, is really that, to mirror that of uh, so, I mean, public media is to, to really serve the public and to give public the public voice. I like to say to people, and we, we're that, uh, if you go into the town square where everybody's talking, we have that little milk crate that we can put on the ground and let you stand up so you can rise above the noise sometime and you get to speak. You don't have to necessarily be on stage all the time to get your voice heard. So that's how we view our mission and what we're doing. And uh, being at, uh, Howard University is our licensee. We're the only HBCU in the country that has a license for a public television station. Um, well, I'm very glad you ended with that, actually. You should keep the mic, Jeffrey, because um, what I want to do next with everyone is uh, I really want to talk about this idea of localism and community engagement, which can sound like jargon until we quickly unpackage them. So I really want to talk tactically about what that means in terms of serving your community. And I just happen to know from my own re research that um, WHUT, for example, does a lot of uh, work with community forums, with campus police and students. You really engage as part of the HBCU community. You have American graduate programs and a partnership with the Maya Angelou Public Charter School. So can you, w any one of those that you want to talk about to really give uh, a, a real image to what it means to serve your local yeah. community? Yeah, we believe that the, the key to our service is partnerships. And um, like I said, we take a lot of the content that's created through public media, through public television, as well as through some of the documentary film, film makers in the area. But what we really do is how can we take it off the screen and take it into the community where they can touch it? And so all of the topics you talked about when uh, we live in the world that has, is a constantly changing world and issues come up, policing. We had um, a, 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 um, not just community, I mean, not just uh, policing on campus, but community policing. We have a great relationship with the uh, District of Columbia Police Department, the Montgomery County, the Prince George's County, even in, in, in Northern Virginia, where we bring them in and we have discussions about what's going on in policing. We talk about a lot of the different and same topics that are being discussed all over the community. One of the things about Washington is like everybody from everywhere in the world, somebody from everywhere in the world is here in this city. Mm -hmm. And so uh, our constituency are people who, who have need and, and who have desire. That's what we have and that's what we, who we see as our target audience. So we don't, somebody spoke earlier about uh, having a, a singular position as a media organization. We absolutely don't have a position. We have a a platform that we allow people to uh, to use in the community. We really are service oriented to the community. But more directly to your question, it's about finding partners that we can work with to enhance those positions or those discussions that need to take place in the community. So Emily, maybe we'll go to you now. So we'll, if you want to offer an example or a, a case study that really brings to light this idea of localism and community engagement. I think sure. you have a clip as well. Yeah, um, and I love your milk crate example because it's kind of true. I mean, it, it really is about the, the community partnerships um, to, to make things relevant on a local level. So um, community engagement at Georgia Public Broadcasting, we do all kinds of screenings and events um, we're a, an Indie Lens pop-up um, producing station. We do TED Talks, Master P, ev everything. Um, kids event, PBS kids events. But 
one of the um, examples that I thought that I would share today, which was kind of an interesting look at how we can kind of reach this statewide audience in Georgia, um, last year we uh, planned a community engagement initiative around the Henry Louis Gates um, series, Black America Since MLK and Still I Rise. And so for that, we had a robust social media campaign where people encouraged, were encouraged to share their stories and their thoughts um, leading up to the premiere of the series. And then we also conducted three screening events that were highly localized. The first one was in Atlanta. Um, and as I said, Atlanta, nobody in Atlanta is from Atlanta. So we had all three of the screening events were the same 30 minute screener of the of the series but the conversations were all very different so the the um, conversation in atlanta was moderated by um one of our radio hosts um from the news side and was actually recorded and then broadcast um on our radio on on our 9 a.m talk show on second thought um also leading up to the to the uh, broadcast of the series. But the panelists included a um, professor from Morehouse College, from Georgia State University, and a community activist. And the conversation was very um, broad on a local level, if that makes sense, because the audience was so diverse. There were people that had, um, there were a wide range of ages, of gender, of race, and experiences. The second screening took place in Macon, Georgia, which is about 85 miles south of Atlanta. It's a small city. Um, it, there's some economic struggles in Macon, and there's some very um, specific yet unspoken racial barriers, geographical, geographic barriers. Um, so it was very much different, very different conversation than that that took place in Atlanta. Um, many of the people in the audience have been in Macon for generation and generation and generation. So the conversation was a little bit different. And then the third um, screening was in Savannah, which is a coastal city in Georgia. Um, and that took place at the Civil Rights Museum in Savannah, um, which was a new community partner for GPB. And again, it was very, um, it was very place oriented. Um, so it was just an interesting conversation, the way that all three of those happened in a different way. And then all of those people were communicating with us on social media, um, which kind of created this statewide conversation. So people in Atlanta, in Macon, and in Savannah were able to kind of experience a little bit of all three of those, which made it interesting. Um, but the video clip that I wanted to share was we um, were one of, I think, five stations uh, who worked with KCPT in Kansas City last year on their Redream project, which was a fascinating um, digital first project where um, each station produced micro documentaries kind of telling the story of, of people in the community and what their, their reality of the American dream is. So we produced eight micro documentaries um, of from individuals and families across the state, state, kind of representing all of those different kinds of populations that we have in Georgia. And we did two events around that. One was a screening party where everybody came together. We showed all the screenings, and it was kind of a celebration. But the other one, we focused on one of those micro-documentaries micro that was um, focused on Nasiha Muchkanovic, who is a Bosnian refugee who has been in the United States for about 20 years. Um, she is a kindergarten teaching assistant. And we held this screening event in Clarkston, Georgia, which is a really interesting place. Clarkston is about 10 miles outside of Atlanta. And it was a, a sleepy southern town. Um, at one point, it was a suburb of Atlanta. The rail, railway goes through there. Um, but over the past 60 years, it has changed dramatically. Um, Time Magazine calls Clarkston the most diverse mile in the United States. Um, there are over 60 languages spoken um, in this tiny little town. Um, there are people from all over the world have resettled there, um, immigrants and refugees. So we hosted this screening in Clarkston, 
Nasiha was there at the Clarkston Community Center, and the audience was a mix of um, friends and friends and family and neighbors from Clarkston, but we had people driving all the way from Macon um, and other parts of the state on a Tuesday night, which if you don't know Atlanta traffic, that's like a huge, huge feat. So um, people were really, really interested. And so we screened Nasiha's um, story and then had this really interesting conversation with a panelist of um, a mix of immigrants and refugees from Metro Atlanta. Um, there was uh, there were someone from Eritrea, Afghanistan, Syria, Nepal, and Sierra Leone, and it was fascinating. And then the audience had the opportunity to share, to ask questions, and the questions were all over the place from issues about resettlement, issues about immigration, issues about um, LGBTQ community. I mean, it was just all over the place. And then share their um, thoughts about what their version and reality of the American dream is. And so we have, I have a little clip from that event. up in Bosnia in, in one of the small town, not having a lot nor uh, missing something. My sons and my husband, we take care of each other, sending children to school, paying bills like ordinary, one of the ordinary family until 1992. The Navy come very close to us and they start bombing. So. We cannot go anywhere except to go all the way to the one of the concentration camps. You know where it's my home? My home is in the United States where nobody call me a refugee. This is a country that can offer a lot. As a parent, seeing my uh, children being educated and having a job, and living in peace. I mean, oh my God, peace. That's something like, I never know what's the value of peace. In order to be successful, you have to have a peace. Know how to love and not being um, afraid to have a voice. I think that we all are responsible for everything that is happening in this country. I think we can make it better. American dream to me, it is having a chances and giving the chances to the others. Okay. So I feel like I know the answer to this, but why did those people drive from so far on this issue? Um, well, I know one person uh, who I spoke with who I asked that question said that he had read in the description of the event online, and we had sent out emails and all of that, the description of Clarkston, and he didn't know anything about Clarkston. Mm. And um, so he, he was curious and came, and then um, I, I think that's really what it was, and I think people um, are kind of surprised that Georgia, I mean, there's a stereotype of um, you know southern states and I think people were kind of surprised to learn that there is this diversity um, that's you know relatively close mm -hmm. so interesting um, well, so Naomi so you serve uh, a different kind of community so how would you yeah. just you should pick up on your cliffhanger which I've already oh, yeah. forgotten uh, <laughs> fall flat on face <laughs> things that aren't working yeah. or something no. like that I, that's a little exaggeration just to get you all <laughs> interested but um so keystone crossroads from as i said from the start has been sort of very active in civic engagement and what we what we did is to hold uh community events public forums i think we call them all around the state it, it did a, it accomplished a few things it allowed my reporters to meet people from all over the state um, and by the way we worked very hard with uh 
a, a consultant called the Penn Project for Civic Engagement to recruit people to come to these events, really sort of go door to door on Main Street and talk to, find out who the sort of active people in the community are. Not so much the political leaders, but the people who are doing community work and sort of un, under the spotlight or outside of the spotlight leaders um, to get people to come to these forums. So we had them all over the state. We would introduce our project and then we would break up into groups and ask people important questions like, you know, what's bothering you about your community? Uh, who are the people who are really making a difference? What would it take to make things better? Have you seen ideas in other places when you've traveled around that you would like to bring back to your community? Um, and generally, these were really robust events where uh, people who were, and, and don't forget we're in distressed cities, so the people who naturally who come to these events are already believers, right? They're optimistic. Maybe there's some nostalgia. And boy, I could do a whole three-year project about nostalgia in Pennsylvania. But, um, but there's something about these people that they want to come together and talk. And some of them haven't met each other. So the great part about these events is, number one, my reporters got to understand a lot about uh, things worth reporting about and sources for that reporting. But also, you know, th our event would end at 9 o'clock and people would just stand around and talk. And you could see these little sparks happening. And that sort of had a life of its own. And, and I love that. Um, the fall flat part is the follow-up, I think. You know, we, m we maybe did a few stories that, that were on the radio, but I feel like we went into these communities and said, hey, we're here, we're doing this great thing, um, and have fun and listen to us. You know, we, we got them, but we didn't quite keep them uh, in a robust way. So I think, I think people can do a better job about that. Um, what uh, I wanted to mention two more things. One is uh, a project called Harkin, which is uh, not our project, but one that we're using. It, Harkin is a plat. I just met the plat. Yeah. yeah, Jennifer Brendel. Yeah. So this woman, Jennifer Brendel, used to be at WBEZ in Chicago, Chicago's public radio station. And she had a project called Curious City. Uh, where she, it's very simple really, you go out and you ask uh, your audience to suggest stories. To, you say to them, what are you curious about that you'd like the answer to? It could be, the popular ones are, what happens to all that stuff we put in the recycling bin? Or what's at the bottom of the lake? I don't know, that's one of the most popular, or the river, that's one of the most popular questions. So people submit these questions and then uh, through this Harkin, what's now called Harkin platform, uh, you have people vote on you know, which question would you like us to answer? Mm -hmm. And so then you answer them. You have your reporters go out and answer them and you present it. Um, so we, we are doing that now at WHYY and at Keystone Crossroads. And I think that's a great way to get uh, your audience involved, uh, not just as passive taking in your stories, but earlier in the process to develop the stories and to pick them. Mm -hmm. That's number two. Number three, um, at some point during our project, we decided to do a podcast. It's called Grapple because people grapple with problems in their communities. And this is our way of sort of doing a quick turn. And instead of just having, just creating three or four minute features for the radio uh, and blog posts or web posts, we decided we wanted to take a deeper dive and really have longer conversations with people and get down on the ground, talk to people about their struggles with their community, their nostalgia about their communities and their distressed cities, um, and their hopes, their hopes and dreams. So we have a clip from Grapple. Uh, this, just to set it up really briefly, uh, this is a young woman who lives in Hazelwood, which is a neighborhood of Pittsburgh, uh, uh, undergoing great change because uh, it was sort of very involved in steel mill and coke mill plant. Um, uh, the site that was abandoned because those industries went, um, now being redeveloped for the tech industry, including Uber, aut autonomous vehicle uh, research, and other things. So. The, the big question we were looking at here in this episode of Grapple, and we'll just play you two minutes, is, you know, what does that site, does the development of that site threaten to gentrify the community in a negative way, or will it, if you don't mind me saying so, gentrify in a positive way by involving people from the community and giving them jobs and not being a terrible neighbor? So we went and talked to, among other people, this young woman uh, about uh, racism in particular. I'm wondering, some of the people I've talked to say that there's kind of a, Hazelwood has always been a pretty diverse community, but mm -hmm. there's also been a lot of racism here. Mm -hmm. Do you think that still stands? It's just, it's just audio. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry, could you start it over? Because this is a really great I moment, and I, I don't want to lose it. I'm wondering, some of the people I've talked to say that there's kind of a, Hazelwood has always been a pretty diverse community, but mm -hmm. there's also been a lot of racism here. Mm -hmm. Do you think that still stands? 
Um. I have to think about that for a minute. So, I don't think I've ever experienced racism firsthand in Hazelwood, but I grew up hearing stories of race riots on Second Avenue or needing like a guide or a protector. How you doing? Hi. To like walk down the street after a certain time or this area when my mother was my age, or not my age, maybe a little younger, was white and you didn't come up here. Or this section of the neighborhood was black and white people didn't go down there. So it was very much that separation, which is still distinct and relevant in Pittsburgh today. Like this is a black neighborhood, this is a white neighborhood. And then you see the disparities and you see the divide based on the houses, who lives there, the stores that are there, um, and things like that. I think now there's been an opportunity for that conversation and people are willing to have it. And sometimes it does come up in community meetings where people are like, back then this happened and we're still doing this. And, but people are much more willing to talk about it and come to an understanding that that's what happened and that's what we're trying to move away from. We're definitely on the precipice of an amazing time in Hazelwood and no one wants to miss out based on wounds from the past. Do you, well, so for me, like I'm not from Pittsburgh and to me it seems like Hazelwood actually is one of the more diverse neighborhoods because mm -hmm. Pittsburgh is so segregated. Mm -hmm. is, like, do you, is that true, I guess? I think so. You have people who are very proud of their roots, so they're not afraid to identify as Hungarian, as black, as Irish, as Polish but still have the understanding that we're all Americans and we're all Hazelwoodians. Okay, so something that's come up with all three of you, and I wonder if you can each reflect on it, is uh, actually I'm going to start with you, Naomi, because um, when I think about your work, I think about the changing models when we talk about public journalism over the years, right? So when I was working at the Inquirer in 1997 or something, um, the term was public journalism, civic journalism, now we have solutions journalism. So these all roughly mean being in the community uh, in a really meaningful way. So um, thinking about the title of our panel here, when we talk about the sometimes lost art of civic del deliberation, when we think about civic engagement, you know, we think about voting, volunteering, there's a whole matrix of things that we officially define as civic engagement. But this art of civic deliberation when we bring people together and we convene a conversation about tough issues that is something that you st stories are uniquely able to do so I wonder I, I don't really have a question other than asking you to reflect on that and really actually also asking you to reflect on why that's valuable and uh, what if we don't have that you know our, the newsroom at WHYY doesn't reflect the city I'll just put it that way. Um, Philadelphia is about 40% black. Uh, our newsroom is not. Our greater listening area is, is probably a lower percentage of, of African Americans. But um, we are undergoing a very big sort of look into, a, into what we do and how can we make it more diverse, how can we grow our audience in ways that go beyond the typical public media audience. The typical public, public media audience looks kind of like me, frankly. Um, white, you know, uh, 50 to 70 years old, well-educated, uh, higher on the, I'm not higher on the economic scale because I'm in public media, but you know, those kind <laughs> of people. Um, and it, it's just, um, it's, it's kind of great in a way because we have really loyal listeners, devoted listeners, but we're not reaching everybody. Um, and it's important too. So these projects I talk about, am I answering your question? These, project, these projects that I'm talking about where we co-sponsor a debate with the NAACP and we reach audiences that maybe are hearing about the event through them and not through us, or not, in addition to through us, or we have a storefront um, kind of presence where in a neighborhood that where we're trying to attract new listeners, or we have Spanish language programming, or uh, all kinds of things that are gonna uh, attract a more diverse audience for us. Um, those are good things to do, and we're really taking a deep dive look at ourselves and seeing if we're doing enough of that. So are you seeing at those kinds of events, and then I'm gonna ask you two to both respond to this, but are you seeing at the, those events this sort of cross-pollination of the, the sort of archetype of the, of the public media person? and to other members of the community that aren't typically in a conversation? We're seeing more of that. 
we're, we're seeing uh, more diversity. Um, and a lot of people are kind of surprised, like, oh, I didn't know this was here. I didn't even know this public service, this public radio service was even part of our community. And they're surprised and happy. I mean, there are, I mean, to put it bluntly, there are plenty of uh, black middle class people in Philadelphia, well-educated and relatively wealthy uh, compared to the average, say, and they should be listening to us at least, you know, and, and, and more, but it's a matter of getting to people, getting them to understand that we're there. Yeah, Emily, do you want to reflect on that? And, and, and actually, just to prompt you a little bit, the, uh, the fact that you all serve rural communities mm -hmm. is something I, I think we need to talk about more. Right. Because in many rural communities, particularly in the South, I'm a Southerner as well, so I feel like I can say that, um, we know that that is uh, often the only way that they are exposed to this kind of program. Right. Or yeah, new programming. It's true, and and I think that um, the work that we do, it is about attracting audiences um, to um, public media, attracting you know listeners and viewers, and growing our audience and diversifying our audience and all of those things. But I think it's also about um, being the the milk crate and um, kind of providing a space for people to experience things communally. You know, it's one thing to watch um, watch a frontline or a documentary or listen to your radio in your car or watch on your couch at home by yourself and kind of internalize, you know, you think about what, you, what you've just consumed, but it's a whole nother thing to consume that as as a group of people and um, and be able to react to it with other people and react to other people's reactions to it um, and I think that is how we build empathy um, and interest in the community and the community the local community but also the larger community like you said it's a lot of, a lot of times you know that's really and truly, I mean, it sounds hokey, but it's opening your eyes, you know, to the larger world. And um, so I think, I think we, um, I think it's a responsibility that we have and that we're really trying to allow people to have, to be interested together <laughs> and, um, and be responsible and be empathetic and kind of nurture all of these things through the content, you know, listening and viewing. Mm -hmm. What was the question? <laughs> well, it was long-winded, yeah. so I can't repeat the whole thing, but I think the gist of uh, what I was trying to ask was this, um, not just the storytelling, but the act of bringing community together and fostering real civic participation and dialogue is the piece that stories alone don't do that. That's a physical activity that happens. So why is absolutely. that important? Well, yeah, it, it is absolutely important, and you're absolutely right. It's not just the programming that does that. It's a, it's a commitment, um, and it's, it's a commitment to, to opening thought. I mean, that's the, one of the things I like most about public media is it generates thought. I mean, I get a lot of questions sometimes when I introduce myself and people come to, oh, you're the black PBS station oh. in Washington. And I'm like, are you the white PBS station? <laughs> and, I mean, and, and, it, and it goes, it, it, it's a yes. culture of things that goes on. I mean, I was at a d talk once, and um, we were having a d discussion about Birmingham bombings bom that took place in Birmingham and where the four little girls died in the church. And the, the orator talked about a, an anniversary of that date and when a church from Ireland sent a stained glass window to the church to replace one of the ones that was blown out and she referred to it as a stained glass with a picture of black jesus and and, and she happened to be in a room full of black people and we were all turned and looked at each other and went black jesus i don't think i ever heard anybody refer to jesus white jesus so why all of a sudden is the black jesus so and to foster those kinds of discussions we constantly, I mean, I remember when we started a year or so ago when a lot of the black men were being killed by police officers and so forth. And we were having programming that we were running 
to highlight that issue and not to take a position on but highlight we we had something that we call black lives matters protect and serve mm -hmm. and where we went into you know where those phrases come from and what they mean i mean the protect and serve most people thought that protect and serve was what the police did well come to find out protect and serve was the winner in a pr contest in the lapd department back in 1956 Nobody sat down at the police department and said, this is what we do. It won a PR contest, and it got stuck on the side of the cars in the L.A. P police department. So that's where it came from. There's no commitment to protect and serve. Protect and serve who? So it, there was no commitment to that. It, it's been all assigned to it by our non-belief and disbelief or and misinformation that we've taken. So our position... Of, of what public media does and how it comes off the screen is the fact that we do these community engagements, that we do these films and these outreach and then have that discussion because as you said, you can take content um, that you took and took it to three different communities in Georgia and had three totally different conversations about that very same topic. And I would venture to guess that it happened all over the country that way because I know as happened with us. We did the same thing. We, did, we only did one uh, screening, but we had a, a diverse group in the room that was looking at, and they all saw different things. They all saw different things. And nowhere else but in public media, I think, does that opportunity exist mm -hmm. to not just put top, uh, information out there and then allow you to just take it and do what you want it with it. And the, it, public media says, now let's come in and let's d discuss it. Let's talk about it. And let's see if there is some agreement in the room. Because if we can't get agreement in the room, we can't, we'll never get it outside of the room. So it is a, it's part of the DNA of what we do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and at the same time, I, I think, I mean, a lot of times when we talk about um, community engagement with storytelling, I think that sometimes there's an immediate connotation that we're talking about ideological advocacy. And of course, you all are public media, so you cannot do uh, ideological advocacy. So how do you all, um, when you think about the role of partnerships and how you bring in local organizations that, uh, you know, for example, maybe in the case of your project, Emily, with um, refugee organizations, how do you how do you do that to actually bring in these partnerships that are going to deal with the issue but they may take the issue into an advocacy place that you all can't. So just tactically speaking, how do you actually architect those programs so that you're allowing the civic dialogue, you're allowing that the civic dialogue with that advocacy is important, and then you have to, you have to back away when somebody else takes it to a place of, and that's why HB whatever whatever is the law we're supporting. Does that make sense? It does, um, and I think that's where um, being thoughtful about setting up the um, setting up the whether it's a panel discussion or a, like a resource fair or that kind of thing um, to be representative of multiple um, m multiple vantage points um, and also to have a really good moderator um, which we are fortunate to have at GPB. Um, I do not moderate those conversations. Mm -hmm. I um, am really fortunate to have some fantastic colleagues in our newsroom who are, who I hope enjoy working with me, they say they do, mm -hmm. um, to moderate those conversations and to, to serve that role. Because you're right, at the end of the day, we're not, you know, we're not advocating, we're just providing the space. And, um, and so it, it is sometimes it is hard not to shy it, it is hard not to shy away from things that you know I'll see really interesting things coming down the pipeline and have an idea like oh we could do this but who that would be that would be a little bit scary um, but uh, but that's what we do you know so we what we try to do what I try to do I get I guess it's my responsibility to make that decision because I, I get my, my, my phone starts ringing when we do controversial mm -hmm. things and it's, it's the people on the other side of the issue or something mm -hmm. that we do. It's like we, PBS uh, has a series coming up 
soon on the Arab Americans, which is a series that we've run before with the Arab Americans. My phone starts ringing when we run the Arab Americans, the Jewish community, that when we have a very large Jewish community of viewers. And they are loyal viewers, and they call up and they threaten me, and they say, hey, you know this, that. And it's, you know, my response to them, I say, if we don't run it, does it mean it didn't happen? Mm. And, and I said, uh, so that is programming that has that position. But we also run a lot of programming that's targeted or that comes from the Jewish community. When you have the programming that you agree with, you can come in, we'll have those discussions as well. So it's about, the way I approach it is, is can I be in the position of having both sides, not necessarily in the same program. It may not be that I have to have a Jewish position versus an Arab position, and right versa, but that I, over the course of a programming schedule, over the course of the year, we will try to be, have a diverse programming offering mm -hmm. to the community. I had one guy call me once and said um, it was during this Black Lives Matter issue and protecting. So he said, you get public funds. You cannot uh, put that kind of programming on the air. I, and I just asked him, I said, public funds, do black people pay taxes? And he said, yes. I said, do black people, white people pay taxes? He said, yes. I said, so they're all public funds, right? I said, so the position that's taken in the program is all supported by public funds. It's not that we are making a taking a position one way or the other. I appreciate your call because I appreciate your passion also for your position. And as we talked it out, we became good friends as we talked about this because we were able to hear other sides of the argument that we don't have. It's sort of a microcosm of what's going on in the country as a whole. We go to our safe spaces where everybody says what we already agree with. Mm -hmm. And so it, it's an ongoing process that you have to do. Could, could I read, um, there's a man named Bill Seemering who's one of the founders of uh, public radio. Uh, and he, back in 1970, came up with a mission statement, which except for one word, I think you'd feel is modern. So, and I'll just read part of it. Uh, mission statement for NPR. It should serve the individual, should promote personal growth, should regard individual differences among men, that's the word, um, with respect and joy rather than derision and hate, should celebrate the human experience as infinitely varied rather than vacuous and banal, should encourage a sense of active, constructive particip uh, par uh, participation rather than apathetic helplessness. Mm. I just love it, and I think it works today. And I think we're all working for that, not always hitting 100%. Yeah, and I think I'm going to open it up to audience questions in 35 seconds, but I, I think just to reflect back on the title of this panel about the idea of a civil society, I think that we can all agree that it's a civil society, which I, I think in our echo chamber, echo chamber Facebook environment, it's awfully hard to have a real civic dialogue, I think, digitally, but this space where people come together physically, it's very hard to... Um, for many people to be hateful physically in, in front of uh, others. So this idea of civic del deliberation, I think, is the key and the convening function that public media plays. And I, it's just one little bit that I want to add um, from my own work and observation about this is, you know, years ago there was some media research that said that actually despite what we think with ideologically polarized news environments, so thinking about the polar extremes uh, between, say, MSNBC and Fox News, there is this belief, and this has probably changed a bit by now, but this idea that we are all ideologically or from a partisan perspective so deeply polarized in almost every issue. And actually, there's media research that shows that that's just not true. We're just, we're just believing that. It's actually not true. Most of us are pretty mainstream in our ideas about values and things that we care about. So issues that I've worked on over the years in terms of media effects research, examining what happens when people watch a story about a particular issue, something like global poverty, for example, I think that we would immediately think, oh, that must be something um, that we must have sort of polar extremes. Actually, no. Uh, Republicans and Democrats actually feel equally the same about uh, global poverty when you expose them to a story. So I feel like this space that public media can serve in a civil society of raising issues, not advocating either way, but raising issues, bringing people t together to have a conversation, that is worth protecting 
and celebrating and not saying that we're always doing it in service of an advocacy goal. Now that's for other people to do, right? Would you all agree? Now that I'm making you agree, because you're sitting next to me. Yes. Um, I mean, if you look at this, yeah. uh, there's something called Solutions Journalism Network. Yeah. They're out of New York City and they, uh, they get grants and they give reporting outfits like mine uh, money to look at solutions, not just mm -hmm. incessantly talk about problems. And it, it was really worked well for us, but we are all very careful to say that we're not advocating a solution. Mm -hmm. We are looking at them, we are getting feedback from people who are dealing with these problems to see would this work in this community or for this group, but not advocating. Mm -hmm. So let's open it up to some questions. There's a microphone some, oh. Hi, um, I guess sort of relating to what you're talking to, like echo chambers, all of these things, when you're producing really localized content, obviously you wanna produce things that the people in your area care about, but how do you sort of strike the balance between that and not sort of making the echo chamber effect worse by focusing on, you know, the only those issues in that little community. You just have to have a diverse newsroom. You just have to have, and I don't mean only uh, racially diverse, I mean politically diverse, mm -hmm. and age, and uh, gender, of course, you know, religion, everything, or even religiousness. You know, you just have to have people around the table who are thinking about what's an important story coming at it from different perspectives. It's the magic of that. I think it's, it's important as to how you tell stories as well, mm -hmm. because it can be specific to this one community. But if you tell the story from the standpoint of its humanity, then its humanity carries beyond that community. That issue that popped, or you tell it from the perspective of that community, but the issue of humanity goes across mm -hmm. all communities. So you look deeper than just the surface of the, of the story. I mean, it, it's like uh, an example I use is, everybody's heard of the D.W. Griffith, Birth of a Nation. But then there was another film came out about a year or so ago called Birth of, the Na Birth of a Nation. Mm -hmm. And it was the same period of time, but from a different perspective. Mm -hmm. And perspective is everything when it comes to telling stories. And what the wow factor is, it comes into play when, it, when you hear something from a different perspective and you can go, well, I never thought about it that way. And I think that's when we do our best work when we offer those stories from different perspectives to our audience. That's the best thing to hear at a, at a, at a conversation, at a community engagement event is, you know, I never thought about it that way. I mean, that's like the ultimate. Yeah, and I feel like, I mean, I'll just add to that a little bit. Like, um, when you think about something like the Syrian refugee crisis and you look at the role that uh, sort of big journalism is playing in that, right? Reporting on the numbers, what's happening, the humanitarian crisis, all of that. But what often documentary storytelling can do within a public media context is really tell the intimate, deep stories about those individual people and show them as people with jobs and families and children and all of that and it, it's not that journalism is falling down on the job but it has it it's, as an institution it has its hands full on that so I, I feel like that piece of changing perspective is a special role that documentary always gets to play because usually we're telling stories about individual people that we can name and see and face so I, I love saying that in a room of filmmakers who else? Oh, it's time to, really? <laughs> oh. Oh, no. Does anybody have one? I'm going to violate that rule. Does anybody have a, uh, one more question? <laughs> or do you just, oh, Mishi. A quick or maybe not so quick question. I'm Mishi Ibrahim. I'm with PBS. And we are living in a, an interesting time right now where the discourse is not civil often. And so I'm just curious quickly if you could talk a little bit about the challenges um, you all face as um, being the town hall for your community. Are there any, any issues? Are there any challenges that you're facing in this day and age as opposed to other times? You may know that NPR uh, decided to drop the comment section on their website. We did 
the same. We did it for different reasons in NPR, but I think other outfits have done that. Uh, call out if you know of others. Um, I know there's some more major outlets that have decided to. It just, it's not a civil discourse sometimes. It's, it's kind of a combination of predictable and ugly in some cases. And you look for the robust discourse. Right now it's moved to Facebook. Sometimes it's robust, sometimes it's still ugly and uncivil. Um, but uh, that's, uh, that's sort of the state of things. I just think it's, it, we're in an evolutionary process here where we hopefully we're going to make our way back to a civil society. But when we look back to when we had a civil society, we had leadership and we had rules. I mean, I think social media has, to some extent, allowed all of that to go away. I am, you know, my own ruler now in social media, as we can tell by the people who tweet and so forth and so on. Mm -hmm. And there are no, no guidelines for that. Um, so it, uh, it says to people on an individual basis, do what you do. You know, you go be you, you do you, and so forth and so on. And it doesn't allow us to have the empathy that we used to, the sympathy that we used to. And I think the storytelling is what can bring it back because on a larger basis, we can tell a story. Because I would defy most people to tell somebody's political persuasion of a well-told story. That's not about politics. Okay. If you have empathy for somebody, you don't stop your empathy and go, well, wait a minute, is that a Republican or Democrat or is that a something or something? You have empathy for that story, that issue, that person. And when we get back to not the labels, but the humanity of how we live together, I think we're gonna, we're gonna do that. But we're in a d difficult place right now, I agree with you, and it's difficult to do that. All right, I think that's, it. Uh, thank you all so much. Uh, special thank you to Jeffrey for coming down with no notice at all. Amazing. I feel like we want to work with you here in DC. Um, so thank you all very much for coming and thank you all for your kind attention. That's lunch. So thank you Katie, Naomi, Emily, and Jeffrey for the wonderful conversation on um, civil society, I think we all, we can accomplish this. We can do this. <laughs> <laughs>